Hola, hola, ¿se escucha? ¿Sí? ¿Bien o un poquito bajo? ¿Bien? Súper. Bueno, buenas noches, muchas gracias a todos y a todas por venir. Mi nombre es Javier Agustín Rojas. Es un placer darle la bienvenida a todos en este nuevo año de actividades públicas que organizamos desde el CEAC. La conferencia inaugural de hoy está a cargo de Johan Arrow, de Arrow Freak, de la oficina sueca Arrow Freak. Pero antes de comenzar, me gustaría comentarles un poco sobre la agenda de actividades para los próximos meses que vamos a tener acá en la escuela. Tienen en las esquinas del taller pósters que no sé si quedaron. Está disponible en la página de internet de la escuela y en las redes sociales. Ya para la semana siguiente vamos a tener más copias para que se lleven todos a casa. La presentación de hoy da inicio al ciclo Nuevos Realismos, sobre el cual les voy a contar un poquito más adelante, así lo hacemos también partícipe a, a Johan. Y va a continuar la semana que viene con la visita de Clara Simay y Julia Turpin del colectivo parisino Grand Duit, el próximo jueves. Y de Luis Leguer, Laurent Didier y Mathieu Leny de la oficina de Toulouse Bast en el mes de abril. Y va a terminar con la presencia de Gilles de la Lex de Estudio Moto en junio. Todas estas actividades las llevamos a cabo con el apoyo del Instituto Francés y de la Embajada de Francia en Argentina, como el año pasado, con quienes estamos muy contentos de volver a colaborar. La programación de esta primera mitad del año también va a contar con una presentación de Giovanna Borassi en el mes de junio, directora del Canadian Center for Architecture, y del teórico italiano Pier Vittorio Aurelli, quien fue invitado por Jorge Francisco Lierno, el director de la Maestría de Historia y Crítica de la Arquitectura, que estamos relanzando este año. Junto a la maestría también vamos a llevar adelante una mesa redonda sobre la importancia de la enseñanza de historia en la arquitectura, frente a un panorama de la CONEAU que pretende juntar las materias de historia en vez de en tres en dos, eh, en el cual van a participar varias referentes de la disciplina del país. Y también vamos a realizar las jornadas de arquitectura y naturaleza en el mes de julio. También vamos a continuar con el ciclo de trabajo de los demás, que como el año pasado buscaba presentar las constelaciones intelectuales de los distintos miembros de la escuela. Vayan pasando, si quieren, hay un poco de lugar en el fondo, les digo a los que están como un poco... Sí, pasen por delante, no hay problema, allá en las dos ventanas de los costados, lo único cuidado allá con el iPad que graba eh, de, no, de no pasar por delante. Bueno, les contaba que este año también vamos a continuar con el ciclo del trabajo de los demás, que busca presentar las constelaciones intelectuales de los miembros de la escuela. Lo vamos a emplear a docentes de distintas generaciones y regiones, como Juan Campanini y Josefina Espósito, que están por aquí, Ignacio Montaldo, profesor del área de construcciones del estudio Moarx, Alberto Feinstein, del estudio de ingeniería AHFSA, y Diego Gras, del estudio chileno Graspatz. También vamos a volver a realizar el ciclo de inscripciones, donde tres docentes jóvenes de la escuela, Tomás Guerrini, Emilia Calleja e Iñaki Arostegui, van a presentar las óperas primas de sus colegas. Y el próximo viernes vamos a tener una actividad del ciclo miscelánea que busca um, trabajar con artistas, cineastas, personajes que estén un poco en el ambiente más tangencial del entorno construido, en este caso con Luis Urúculo. Bueno, y por último me gustaría contarles un poco sobre la pieza gráfica que están viendo, diseñada por María Pía Castro de la Torre, a quien le agradecemos su, su trabajo y su diseño. Esta pieza se suma a las iteraciones de los diseños anteriores, cada semestre estamos trabajando con un diseñador o una diseñadora distinta, estas son las ediciones anteriores. Todos los eventos están cargados en el canal de YouTube de la escuela y si alguno no tiene un póster anterior y le gustaría tenerlo por, por la gráfica o alguna cuestión, también hay en los costados del taller. Bueno, antes de terminar me gustaría contarles específicamente de hoy y voy a pasar al inglés así Johan se suma a la conversación. Johan, thank you for accepting our invitation to present your work today here at the school. As we've talked in the past few days, this is the starting activity in a cycle of presentations with denominated new realisms, and that intends to address a shift in architectural culture in the past few years, where the ordinary and the mundane have gained attention once again. 
taking the cue from the French art movement of the 1960s of the same name, Nouveau Realism, the goal of New Realism is the same, to bring art, in this case architecture and life, closer together. This doesn't only mean an architecture that is more pleasant to its human and non-human inhabitants, but one that also assumes the aesthetic of showing its bones, its mechanisms, its assemblage. This is, of course, nothing new. Philipp Ursprung, the Swiss academic, critic, and writer, considers realism in architecture as a discontinuous thread that runs throughout the second half of the 20th century. One can obviously find its roots in the work of the Smithsons and their interest in regaining the spirits of life in the streets, visible in Nigel Henderson's photographs, which is carefully considered in Jesus Vasallo's latest book, Epics of the Everyday, Photography, Architecture, and the Problem of Realism. In this cycle of presentations, we will hear different approaches of, of this spirit, such as the reclaiming of the as-found aesthetic approach to tectonics of the office past, or the participatory design process of the collective Grand Ritz. In all cases, I believe we will see an architecture that finds precise ways to deal with contemporary austerity and scarcity, leaving behind the dogmas of previous generations of avant-garde that sought novelty for overall, and that instead focuses on languages based on an economy of means, an architecture that is thought of as a framework built to be appropriated that seeks to contribute actively to urban life, an architecture that doesn't try to leave a new imprint on the urban fabric, but instead accepts to work with what's already there, something that Nicolas Bourriot synthesizes as the will to learn to inhabit the world instead of trying to build it accordingly to a preconceived idea. I think we can see this in how softly Johann's houses reach the ground, always with minimal intervention in the natural landscape, or in how much space they release towards the free appropriation of the users in his apartment blocks. But I would like to invite Marcelo Feider now, or Dean, for a more careful consideration of this work. Thank you. Bueno, buenas noches. Eh, es un placer arrancar el, el, el ciclo así con la, con la sala llena. Eh, well, eh, prometo ser breve también. Eh, today I personally met Johan Arup. Uh, it is true that we had already seen each other uh, via Zoom because of an ongoing project in Buenos Aires. But even so, today, uh, once again, I experienced the same feeling as when I discovered the amazing work that Johan has been producing together with Henry Frick since 2010. Uh, I am referring to a curious sensation that combines, in one hand, a warm familiarity and, on the other hand, allow us to experience a certainty of being in front of a body of work and a person charged with an enormous potential for novelty. It's likely that the familiarity to which I refer is due a generational coincidence. As much as almost all of us make an effort to delineate a singular profile, our work is di directly influenced by the work of the architects that precedes us. In the case of our generation, um, I, I dare to say that the influence of the work of Anne Lacaton and Jean-Philippe Basal is offered to us as a common ground capable of bringing together a great diver diversity of derivations. However, I refuse to claim that the second part of my argument, the one related to the new, is due to the fact that their practice is based in Stockholm and the variables and co contingencies of their environment are enough to drive an agenda as fresh and emphatic as the one that Arrow Freak offer us. Instead, I prefer to speculate that in the academic work that Johan produces together with his student at the Academia di Arquitectura de Mendricio, there are some clues to access the singular point of view that is perceived in each project of Art of Freak. The idea of precision, in their case, 
transcends the geometric precisions to develop directly an exhaustive knowledge of the material culture of our present. By extending the question, how simple can we live? Johan forces us to travel a long journey that goes from the knowledge of our natural resources through the construction industry to the real estate business, reaching also the coexistent group that, and their social protocols. What is admirable and hence our interest in this being the lecture that kick off the 2023 is that Arrow Creek can reorganize this constellation of overlapping interests through the kind of commission that make the 19% of our city, that is uh, collective housing, buildings, and isolated residential pavilion. When we study the edition for Tushi Magazine or, or the recent publication that El Croqui is dedicated to their work, we mostly find houses and housing blocks. Arrow Freak has managed to deploy a critical practice with an enormous capacity for disciplinary penetration through ordinary commission. In other words, commission linked to the same problems that any involved professional is going through. And that is, for me, the main achievement. It is likely that very soon we will be able to continue learning about how their vision of the world overlaps with new uses and environments. Their curricular or industrial project anticipate that the programmatic denomination and the variables provided by the diverse, uh, diverse environment are only capable of feeding their attentive and permeable gaze. Arab Freak already has a point of view. And, that, and this is the most complex project an architect can undertake. Please help me welcome Johan Arab with a big applause. It's unmuted. There it should be. It's fine. Thank you so much, um, Javier. First, for uh, your words, very interesting uh, start. Uh, Marcelo also, maybe I don't need to show my projects now because you explained it very very well, I think. And, um, and I'm happy with these words also and I, I, I agree and we are not there but we are um, constantly struggling and fighting for achieving something that we believe in. So I'm happy to share a little bit with you uh, uh, tonight. Uh, about this. It might be um, um, also, I mean, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm a little bit uh, uh, dizzy after a uh, long travel and a uh, long day. Maybe this presentation will be a little bit like that. Uh, it's, it's a little bit like my mental statement, uh, but um, I hope you can um, enjoy and feel a little bit um, glimpses and maybe fragments of what we are doing, me and Henrik and Carlos, with partner as well. Um, and um, we are, I can just mention, we are I'm from Stockholm in Sweden, so it's uh, it's really, I mean, you notice it when you saw the on the flight, I mean, it's uh, really on the opposite side of the world, basically a completely different landscape. Uh, our office is about 10 people, we like it the size because we can uh, uh, do small things, we can do big things, but we can always be a part of it. And this is the important thing for us. Um, I will not show you one project after the other. Uh, again, it's more like maybe themes that we're working on. Uh, and maybe even for me, <laughs> good to see uh, the themes and the projects together and uh, how it's uh, arranged. So, <clears throat> I will start from the very beginning, uh, and this is uh, actually, these are my grandparents and my mother and her siblings there. And uh, I 
this picture came to my mind. I have it in uh, it's a, in a folder back in the uh, bookshelf. But uh, I mean, they were constantly moving uh, in the southern parts of Sweden. Uh, my grandfather was always building cottages, uh, and then when it was finished, they lived there for maybe a year or so, and then they bought another piece of land and built another one. Uh, they were always very small and simple, and uh, but he was quite involved in, or they were involved in a very, or like a movement uh, that was, the main ambition was to live quite simple. They were, I mean, they didn't eat meat, they were vegetarians, living a lot outside. So uh, this is another photo of my, my mother and her brother there. And the second cabin where you see the roof is a little bit extended. So basically, uh, I try to understand what they, they were doing. I mean, he was not an architect, uh, he was just building, he was a like, inventor, made uh, different tools uh, uh, for kitchen and the later for other uh, tool makers. Uh, but the main principle was, was simple like this. It was <clears throat> first one room and then uh, this I think is second version with two rooms, quite small. And then the out outdoor space was constantly expanding. Uh, another, he was not an architect either or educated, but became one like self-taught. He didn't have any education. He came from a furniture making family, Bruno Matson. He started with some shares um, and uh, finding always like just very hands-on back to basic how to for instance this chair he was sitting in the snow finding the perfect curve for a chair and then he made the chair uh, he built his own house uh, some years after because he was starting to experiment a little bit larger and larger so started with small objects and then eventually a house and this is in the west uh, part of Sweden uh, actually experimenting a lot with oh, not only the components, I mean he made his own glass panels and, and these kind of things, but also with <clears throat> quite early with thermal layers and also how to live uh, in a maybe a little bit new ways, quite intuitive. So um, the uh, big part of a process is uh, notes I, or small text, I, I've always done that a lot. Um, sometimes it's connected to projects, sometimes it's connected to, I don't know, life. Uh, I like to read a lot, but not like books. I like to read really short, quick, and maybe a few words every day, but that's enough. Uh, and this one I, I found, uh, and uh, uh, maybe 10 years ago or something, um, we, not, we don't save it, we just write it and we uh, throw it away or place it in a book or something. But, I mean, the basic principle of this is that I told, I think, Xavier yesterday that we are hardly making any projects that are not getting built. We really want to build things. We, and this is our really uh, focus. And uh, since you got this family introduction, um, I, I found this uh, really recently. It's, this is from my uncle that you saw in the picture before. He's making now uh, these very simple stoves that you can, uh, that is able to produce heat because it has this layering of uh, like a fat chimney, but only with metal, and also that you can cook on. <clears throat> and now he's um, making, uh, I think it was first 200 of them, sending them to Ukraine for the world, which, war, which is terrible. And now they, it, was, it worked really good, so they continue with 400 and then 800. And the ambition was to make something, make a decent, you know, uh, equipment for the people in, in the situation, uh, less than, uh, I think it was 100 US dollar, like, and uh, maybe it's, I don't know, a lot here, but to make this in, uh, in, in Sweden, it's impossible. But, but they really, you know, try to find every uh, piece in the most simple way. And, uh, and be able to make this. So I really appreciate these small uh, you know, inventions. So we prefer a lot in the office always to work quite analog. <clears throat> it's always, we've always done that. Both it's quick, it's intuitive uh, for the whole office's help, 
powerful because we can avoid the computer quite a lot. I don't know how you work here in academia, but I encourage you to never stop using your you know, pen and hand. You can keep it open, the project quite long, keep it alive, not to frame it too much. Sometimes it could be, you know, just very simple to understand the potential of a view or something, or a landscape, <clears throat> a house connected to a landscape. So this is also something that we are interested in to, uh, you know, architecture that we don't really notice, that buildings are somehow a bit uh, behind or secondary. These are some very old pictures that I took uh, long before architecture school. But often dealing with the relation between you know building or an open space and where different activities actually can take place within this. So the central question in the office that we discuss a lot is, is about uh, the purpose of adding something. Should we add something? Do we provide for better qualities? And these questions is uh, you know constantly uh, on our table. And quite often we start our projects only by imagining how a place could be given possibilities to be activated rather than uh, following a fixed program, but <clears throat> rather to think about how different multiple programs could work together. And this is a cultural building we're working with now uh, in a really small town. I think it's around 10,000 people there, southern parts of Sweden. Uh, and the client came to us and he owns the whole block there with the family and they asked us what, what we basically what we believed in here uh, so it was su super free but we started with um, a, like a survey of not only the town but the context uh, the different towns connected to this and um, at the moment we started we realized that this project was all about economy, creating a foundation for a realistic economy, not to, about building it, but about, uh, you know, making it happen. So first we propose to add some extra space for possible extra programs in order to help each other uh, based on this investigation. It's a lack of a music school in the larger area. So we propose that and add it to relation to a concert hall that is also lacking, uh, and the city as well as the concert hall need the restaurant, and so on. So this was this kind of uh, equation of uh, how to make uh, a working uh, economy for this project, basically. So structurally, platforms that could be extended with new activities. The outside could be imagined in the future uh, as the inside. And uh, <clears throat> I've also tried uh, or I'm try, trying, it's not easy to build a house for me and my family. Uh, and we bought this uh, plot um, like an hour ago, an uh, hour away from Stockholm, um, three, two year, three years ago or something. And we had, uh, you know, uh, plans, of course, of building something uh, there. Uh, building something really special, building something unique. Then the pandemic came, <clears throat> then the war uh, with huge inflation and the material prices were like uh, extreme and uh, in terms of handling resources, this was extreme, so everything was extreme. So we now we are, we'll start to build and it will be extremely uh, simple in terms of construction as well as living. Um, a whole house that is um, almost uh, nothing. It will be an open structure uh, for possibilities. And this is really how we prefer to do things. Never uh, grand gestures, uh, simple spaces, simple structures, generous spaces, um, comfortable spaces to live in, basically. We recently got the commission to uh, uh, redo the architecture museum in Stockholm and for us it's uh, of course a big thing and uh, now it's a very closed museum it's uh, kind of a elitistic uh, place I would say uh, I would dare to say um, but in a very central position so uh, me and Henrik got the keys to the museum uh, and it's four million objects it's the largest collection in Europe and for me and Henrik we are really 
both coming from like painting and art uh, thing and we we could not uh, leave these places you know because it was amazing drawings from uh, historical times and models and stuff so it's like a big uh, machine of uh, material that is not uh, visible at all so we wanted immediately to turn the space upside down uh, no design strategy more like a statement a place for everyone that was the main kind of goal public but also for workers uh, no hierarchy between them to begin something a little bit like a <coughs> Old town that is uh, organically uh, one step after the other con uh, growing, not make the whole master plan, but but more intuitive and uh, naturally. Something like a building uh, that we always prefer to be uh, natural or has been you know naturally developed, like this small cabin. You hardly see it there, but you see the roof a little bit in big so. Um, Sometimes you don't really think of it at all. Uh, it's basically nature and the roof. This is another project at Bredaren we, we did uh, quite recently. So it's, it's about natural development, uh, always based on the conditions of a place. And it's uh, natural conditions, but it's character also. A little bit like the Midweek House, uh, one hour from here actually, uh, that we visited today during construction. It's a few walls, <coughs> basically in a piece of flat uh, landscape. So as uh, Marcel were mentioning, I'm visiting professor in Mendrisio for a few years now. And uh, the important thing for me there, I've been there a lot before, uh, but it's really to, uh, you know, not to tell solutions. I only want to raise questions to the students. I want them to be, you know, individual that can think, that can, can figure out themselves a language, not to implement a language. So for me, this title is about understanding potential in every context, every situation, material, techniques, economics, social climate. It's always be very critical to filter and avoid unnecessary things and always to bring the potential of the very small things. So as mentioned, my uh, our my family and <laughs> our plot, uh, we couldn't uh, build anything. Um, but uh, instead, we were we have been spending about two years, not completely full time, but uh, in uh, weekends and so on. You know, living outside. Basically, we have been uh, sleeping in uh, in tents, making. Fabric. I think this is the first one, like a roof, but then it was the second one and the third one, and then all of a sudden we had a perfect, uh, very simple uh, place to be. We're cooking outside. Is the hair? Cooking outside. Um, living, uh, finding the things on the ground that we can make, making fire, cleaning up in the lake. Um, all these kind of small arrangements to make life comfortable. This is another housing project that we're working on at the moment. It's in outside Stockholm in Mellerhöjde. So it's completely developed from full-size prefabricated system. It's really like no exception. We calculated every transport. Uh, <clears throat> it should be completely, you know, compact, no transport of air, only material. Um, no cuts of uh, the uh, precast uh, or prefab uh, elements. Everything by standard uh, uh, measurements, uh, and also the most minimal amount of material that we could use. So, traditional structures we quite often study. It's interesting because it's very back to basic. It uh, uses the least material possible, still making uh, statements, I think. We can make architecture. We can put it. Um, so quite often the most simple and primitive uh, decisions are uh, just, I can, uh, I can do it like this, it's fine. 
change. But it's it's yeah. fine. It's fine. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, the most simple and primitive decisions I think are the most important uh, to get the rational economy, for instance, where you can build without blasting or remove any masses or taking down trees. So we always choose to focus on just a few things. Uh, when we know all there is about this, we take the next step. So in the Architecture Museum, we basically dismantle and resu resemble everything existing in the space. The basic knowledge of where the material comes from, the parts that you can get from a tree, for instance, how to use those parts in the best possible way. We did an exhibition in um, Venice some years ago, it was called 25 Trees and it was basically investigated methods for achieving the maximum amount of a built space using the minimal amount of material. So it was this pure space frame, truss-like structure, dependent on the stable triangle. And because of this geometry, each element transferred the tensile compression loads uh, with no additional need or, uh, for stabilization. So this scenario became a whole of 2,000 cubic meters, I think, out of 25 trees. <laughs> so our research in Mandricio is very much focused on material and where it comes from, how to use it. I think I brought some stuff from there because we are in an academic environment here and uh, maybe it could be interesting for you to see a little bit what we are working with as well. So now they know basically everything there is to know about timber from species, drying processes, environmental aspects, logging emissions, transporting things back and forth, how it's really working, it's a disaster. To the difference between the natural planted forests to import and uh, export and all the you know, economical uh, consequences. And we see it even more clearly now after COVID. Uh, it's really catastrophic way of buying, transporting, uh, everything is happening. So in a town one hour from Indrisio, a group was operating. They found these electrical towers that were not used with a magnificent uh, capacity in the steel. This is the elements. And they, um, <clears throat> that became this new multi-program center for the town on the left side there, completely free of material. And combined with a factory <clears throat> that, was, that is actually going to happen, uh, that uses about 20% of this space, uh, but producing uh, the extra heat needed for the space. <laughs> so it's a completely self-supporting structure, both in terms of material and uh, uh, energy. In another town, a group discovered an unused uh, oasis in a dense urban environment. Access and control of water level and protected species were established. They only basically established this uh, network of communication and uh, controlling the uh, level of the uh, uh, river. So in Vigse, where I showed before, the structure saw, served also as a scaffolding for one, uh, one builder that made the whole house to work from. So he erect, erected this in, uh, yeah, let's do it. Is it okay? Sorry for the interruption. Now it's uh, much nicer, right? Yeah. It's, it's not uh, so good to have this uh, thing. <clears throat> um, so um, he built this uh, structure, the main structure, in um, I think uh, four days. And then it became this platform to work from. <clears throat> so in our studio in uh, Mendrisio, we threw coffee beans sometimes on the world map, uh, just to uh, you know. Uh, with the ambition that the research never should get the same point of departure. And I think this is very important because sometimes you are really used to your you know, local neighborhood and uh, uh, your city or country or whatever, and, um, and it's very limiting, I think. So to explore 
uh, or operating completely out of comfort zones around the world, I think it's a, it's a very good uh, challenge. So, for instance, they were in Spain, Galapagos, Indonesia, Yemen, Kamchatka, Oregon, Russia, Angola, Greenland, even Sweden. So only discovering built, unbuilt environment, migration, natural conditions, microclimate, microeconomies, and they were like detectives uh, discovering new territories, situations. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, interesting literature also relating to this. Discovering traditional techniques, um, local interventions. Um, this image is, I really like this image, is from Kyoto and during the warm uh, period um, that they made uh, simple platforms on the river. So the mist is like evaporating and creating this microclimate down there. And maybe you would have needed it last week, or I heard it was quite warm. <laughs> but, um, or sometimes just use uh, what there is to use. Understanding this uh, social and economic uh, climates. Everyday life, basically. Animal migration. And for us, I think, to understand all these components and also, of course, nature, trees, rocks, species is really key for us and uh, we're something we're really interested in. Also to understand the already built, the history in Sweden in this case, uh, how it was made and why it was made like that. It's a very you know, cold climate in general and the discussion of insulation and daylight is always present when we do projects now. This is actually one of uh, Sigurd Leverens' own photos uh, about or uh, of other houses. So we also study some present and depressing <laughs> development uh, that is happening a lot in, in, in Sweden uh, and around Stockholm. And this really turns this dilemma of the insulated wall that should be like this and the lack of light uh, at this, you know, most, uh, uh, yeah, deep point. It, it was very happy to talk today with Marcelo and uh, Juan and, and Sebastian about their approach and how to develop things in a different way and to take control of things. And I think this is the important thing. And uh, I mean, we are not uh, complete, as I mentioned in, in the beginning, we like to learn every day. We appreciate a lot to develop uh, things together, uh, expertise to uh, change uh, fields, to, uh, to, to collaborate. In the Architecture Museum, we wa want all expertise to be involved. It's really treasure, as I mentioned before. This is a very early sketch of the museum that, that is like this, but this is the, the basement and where all activities are going on. And it's completely dark, And but it's a lot of people there working, <coughs> you know, digging in the archives. Uh, and this is what we want to turn in this museum to, to make it public. So researchers combined with the public, all exposed, and open, different routes can be arranged since everything is flexible that we're proposing. At the same time, we draw this kind of uh, very simple drawings. Uh, we have this direct line with, uh, like on Skype, with uh, the factories, often in the Baltic countries, more or less on a daily basis. So we're really interested in this, the details, of course, but let's say more clever solution of how to put things together in the most uh, in a more more effective effective way also searching uh, always searching for reducing the number of elements to be transported uh, the production time reduces and we could invest more on the budget for instance in larger apartments sizes with for the same amount of money larger balconies better qualities for the user in the midweek house <coughs> Um, that we developed actually during the pandemic. It was a bit special, but me and uh, Sebastian and uh, Marcel were having this uh, Zoom uh, talks all the time. I tried to understand Buenos Aires uh, on, <laughs> on a screen. It was uh, a bit special, but it, it worked out. A few walls uh, on a beam on top inserted in the garden. 
This is a nice photo from uh, the water, no uh, spring. It's the opposite way around, yeah, from uh, Javier. So we like to a lot to work with sandwich walls. <coughs> Uh, maybe not in this project, but <laughs> that's another story. Um, and uh, most of the builders, at least in Sweden, really likes it. You build one floor and then you finish it and then you move on to the next one. In this case, it was the structure as well as the facade, uh, as well as frames for manageable uh, window sizes in Hammarbygård project. Quite often we make the joints with extra margin. Uh, to avoid this kind of super precision uh, that, I mean, it's, it's quite good in Sweden, but it's not Swiss uh, precision. Uh, so we, ne we need to find tools to, to handle this. And for us, it's not so important if it's uh, a little bit off, or, but as, as long as you have a thought for it and can handle it in different ways. So we never do uh, like a building or we try uh, that everyone, consultants, builders need to struggle a lot for to manage. Uh, we like to take decisions together. We like to work with the builder, uh, the developer, not against, even though we have different opinions, but it's, it feels, or it, for us, it's, it's a lot more simpler, the whole process. For instance, the client that wigs the house, he grew up at the site, he's been there for 20 years or even 30 years and they know every rock, every uh, piece of you know, plant and know exactly where the house should be. We like to use the similar process when we develop things with the projects with the cities, like this case it's in a smaller town in the uh, um, southern part of Sweden in Jönköping mostly six-story blocks and uh, the client asked us to make the six-story building uh, we uh, we actually don't uh, do a lot of models in the office uh, but um, sometimes it's really good for discussion uh, so we brought this I think 40 50 models to the city architect and this um, six-story building uh, he got really engaged and really liked this project so it turned out to be uh, 14 stories in the end and uh, it has some shift to control this kind of six-story level in the city. Uh, it was four, 14, not it originally 16, but then we realized that the church was uh, like <laughs> 16, so it was impossible. So it's now it's 14 stories, and now it's under construction. So the base <clears throat> you see here of the six floors. And the upper level uh, levels uh, recessed according to the surroundings, the context. So I really appreciate, appreciate this method. Let's, uh, let's say that we are not uh, designers, we're more like filters or um, part of this process, uh, filter and, uh, and reduce and uh, simplify and then we have something. So we like to make buildings that are as independent as possible all the time. Uh, we have a low-cost weekend house in Vedder that we want to make the user to take a big part of it. It's on water, drain system, uh, the arrangement of the um, partitions or the up, um, envelope could be uh, closed open uh, based on the sun radiation. And this is uh, the plan of this house I showed you earlier, Bruno Matson's own summer house. And he was really obsessed by living outside, like my grandparents. They had always had this uh, thing, it's called a solgård, a sun garden, in, uh, in the center of the house. And it was completely uh, protected on the sides, but always open to the sky. So it, it was protected from the wind, but open to the sun. <laughs> This is uh, this other of Gordon, my own product, uh, the layer, a wooden structure, uh, similar material in full length panels on the outside, this fiberglass that uses or will use passive heating of the building. In this cultural building, uh, I showed you before with the co working economy, we're now presenting uh, some options, quite a lot of options, uh, of how to use the building in a a bit more hands-on way. 
presenting not one option but different uh, option with different qualities cons- uh, combined with different option and installation. We would like to achieve natural light, uh, high performance curtains for sun radiation, solar roofs, natural ventilation when it's possible. We're also developing a factory building at the moment, which is I, I really like this product because it's uh, the first really just a big machine. Um, and uh, also the machines in here produces extra heat in order to heat this uh, space uh, together uh, with ra- radiation from the sun. <coughs> we have a few extra insulated spaces uh, that needs to be extra heated, uh, but that is extremely compressed like small uh, cabins. So basically it's a wooden structure that is covered in this uh, semi-transparent facade layer. And the housing project I showed in Malerhöjden, it uses the sun radiation uh, to a certain limit as well, together with two stoves, uh, like fireplaces, but controlled fl- fireplaces, like my uncle, uncle's ones, but, uh, and uh, these chimneys, so it's one uh, outside and then one inside, uh, two per apartment. So towards the south, there is this recycled uh, PVC curtain that collects the heat. On the beam on this midweek house in Buenos Aires, uh, we have two or actually three additional layers. It's the glass uh, <clears throat> that can be movable and completely open up the structure. We have outside a, a, a screen, a sliding screen that also take care of um, sun radiation, but also like potential animals or you know, mosquitoes or something like that. So the house will be constantly in change uh, the appearance um, from outside as well as inside, depending on the seasons and hours of the day. The house at Vedo, <coughs> with these areas that is semi protected from wind and rain. <coughs> Sorry, try to be still. Um, the client actually celebrated the new year in this uh, space here and it was perfectly fine. So uh, me and Henrik, my partner, we did the two last years in school uh, together, and this was special. We had a professor, Anna Bettencourt, and she had, uh, I don't know, quite a radical way of teaching uh, at that time, at least. Uh, we didn't do any uh, building. We learned that after, uh, or we are learning. <laughs> and uh, basically, we're only analyzing different parts of uh, society, political aspects, economical systems, environmental issues. This was in uh, 2005, I think, or seven, uh, before this whole talk about uh, the environment started. So we got a quite good foundation of this. Sometimes we did the small inventions to adapt theory into practice, like this small device um, creating light from movement energy. We try to understand every situation and the potential use and the output and adapted it where it was needed or the small uh, uh, interventions like adding light in dark places for instance. Um, so all these investigations and devices were tested like case studies. Um, in this case it was uh, the High Line in, in New York before it was renovated and at that time it was abandoned and uh, we made it a completely public with completely made of existing conditions. So we spent a lot of time here climbing over fences, mapping and later developed the public space using uh, the existing uh, uh, conditions like heat emissions, prevailing winds, collecting, cleaning rainwater. Um, for us, it was really difficult this because it was uh, no beginning, no end. It was not, let's say, a pro- program and then build a fire station, build a church or whatever. It was uh, entering a you know black hole <laughs> or something. Uh, so we were struggling a lot, but actually this kind of thinking is still uh, very central in our process to be able to figure out for real what is working and not and how situations could be improved. Uh, to understand uh, the conditions of every situation. Then you often have a solution to a problem. In Mendrisi we study a lot of like relevant projects 
in these kind of aspects. Like this is Sean Philip Vassal's first project in Africa. Uh, it took him three weeks to, or not him, but uh, I think there were a group of seven, eight, eight people there, locals, to find the material like straw and uh, uh, pieces of, of wood. Uh, and uh, to find it and assemble it and then it took three years for this to disappear. In the architecture museum that I showed uh, we were asked to design a, a new museum within this pr uh, protected spaces basically like a, ca a blank canvas but when we started this process we uh, discovered two existing exhibitions one the one on the right there it's a major structure, it's massive amount of steel. Um, uh, and then the one on the left, it's uh, another exhibition now going on on an architecture office with this, uh, I think it's 108 huge glass panels, like super thick and uh, a lot of light, a lot of wood, a lot of everything. So we started uh, by saying or asking ourselves, um, I mean, uh, can this be the new museum? Um, so we were analyzing the components. We find uh, found uh, thousands of pieces of steel, wood, glass, um, and uh, we asked the museum if what, what if they had any idea of what to do with it after, but they didn't. So we said uh, that this could be our uh, uh, components to work with. So. In my own small house, we don't really know the program yet. Uh, we met in a structure as a part of the land. And basically we think after spending a lot of time there, uh, outside, we think the house is basically there by itself. Uh, the idea now is basically just to propose a new large shed to protect uh, this piece of ground a little bit from the weather conditions and a certain amount of security, of course. So to be careful when changing a site uh, or that if you do it, you need to be very sure. I mean, Marcelo mentioned it also before that this is something we work with a lot. So in this week's uh, project, uh, we found this site uh, a lot based on the client and we had this rope that we tried a little bit here and there and uh, moving it. And I think it took over a year <laughs> to actually find the right spot in the end. So we had more or less the possible size. Uh, we had an idea of a laminated timber uh, structure. So we made this house elevated from the ground, leaving the nature intact. Um, so as much as possible, we want to make the buildings really not interfering with nature. <coughs> like you could almost one day uh, take it away, demount it, and put the nature back and maybe move the house to another place. So we really believe in this uh, um, making open-ended structures that can handle change of time, change of use, especially nowadays. Um, we started uh, in Madrisio by to make and to understand uh, calculations. Uh, we started really simple and then I am really fasc fascinated about this and, and do it a lot. Um, so we started really simple, but uh, built on more uh, further on in the semester. In this case, it was about timber. So we compared uh, uh, massive wood with laminated wood, for instance. The consequences if you change capacity to build tall structures to understand how much material is needed. The different capacities, if you change dimension on one pillar, add another one, things happen with the structure always together with calculations on the structure, but also regarding the cost. So this was like, not like a boring calculations. Uh, I mean, they, they were struggling a lot and they thought it was quite boring in the beginning, but then when they see that, well, this, uh, this is actually happening, if we change this, then it becomes a tool for you. Uh, so be, to be aware of the outcome of every decision is, uh, I think for me, very important also to build and to feel when you change a structure, you change the amount of money into a structure uh, and the capacity. So the basic knowledge was always connected <coughs> to development of uh, the students' projects, to be very precise, to understand how to optimize them and to use 
as little material as possible. And I mentioned before also earlier today that we always work with a structural engineer with this to be very precise, even though it's super abstract and radical, it's always working, uh, I think, I hope. Um, our internal project in, uh, process in the office is similar. It's a lot of uh, simple <coughs> questions about standard components. Why choose this beam instead of this beam? Um, and this is from the sculpture building I showed before. Uh, we've tried everything from concrete to metal to timber. We're always presenting multiple options uh, with pros and cons on everyone. So now this is the section, how it's going to be, and it's uh, uh, four uh, open platforms in timber that can become eight. In uh, Hovgården, we have now established this uh, structural principle with a wooden factory with the uh, most essential components, the post and beams from the catalogue, floor, uh, roof, closed facade elements from the factory, and always the sizes according to the trucks to pack it complete. Uh, no transport of air again. Um, if you don't have a wall, you need to have a stabilization. And this is uh, very simple, uh, just uh, basic <coughs> calculations of the minimal amount of capacity that we need here. In the architecture museum, we imagine this space in constant change. It should always be, you know, interesting, relevant, uh, endless possibilities for the workers to the, the people that are working there to have all like the, the greatest tool to uh, um, combine research, uh, the archive, uh, contemporary architecture and design together. Quite often, we make this. Uh, very simple frameworks in projects for different programs, even though we asked for, a, like, let's say, housing or office or something, because we know now quite well the different materials, the capacity, the distances. So this is important. Uh, I mean, that the component becomes the building and the building doesn't, uh, I mean, <laughs> so it's not the other way around. Sometimes you see a lot that uh, you design something and then you need to try to solve it and everyone is really angry and it uh, turns to be a problematic project or expensive one or something. But this is something that we really... Uh, is, is kind of uh, important for us. I brought the student to this house. I was in Latapi Lata House in Bordeaux. I looked at Vassal and it was one of the first projects. I was there, I think, 2001 or something when it was recently built. And actually, Madame Latapie La still uh, lives here. Now it's uh, Seoul, I heard. But uh, the, this fall, uh, some months ago, we met her and they were really, it was great to talk to them about this house and how they live it in different ways and so on. But for me, I mean, the first, uh, really, what's really impress impressed me the first time I, I visited, I remember it really w well. It was this structure that it was, all the parts and components were like uh, perfect for their use. It was not like, let's say we have this grid and we need to just make it. I heard uh, by Anne that they started like that, but then the cost was like too extreme. So then the engineer started to, you know, make everything more uh, delicate and perfect. And just according to what is uh, need, that the beam was not larger than it needed to be. So this is uh, from one of our very first houses. It was made by light concrete blocks. So we d were just basically following the catalog, the description, to avoid uh, any waste at all. So it was a house made of six walls. And this is during construction. So in Hammarbygård, we discovered also how to build large for the first time. For us, this was really important. The production, the economy, it produces the market. And we didn't uh, know anything uh, before that because we were only doing theory. <laughs> but so this was for us a uh, really good ed education, I would say. Uh, in German, this is from Andrisio. Uh, one group um, two years ago, they found out that this, uh, the rackets of the palm trees is often tr thrown away when they, they do this process of cutting and using the palm tree. So they started to look at furniture, traditional furniture making things uh, to combine it uh, with different techniques uh, to, so it becomes basically similar to a laminated uh, timber uh, beam. So 
these rackets became uh, pillars and beams and they started to combine it to become this huge uh, vault uh, roofs amazing structures uh, that um, pres uh, made uh, possible uh, big covered spaces basically basically in Sweden one group uh, you have a lot of these pine needles perfect for insulation you had a lot of these bags from IKEA in Indonesia I think this is uh, they were investigated these traditional scaffolding techniques using local bamboo good thing is that basically everyone knows how to do it and it's very simple very quick and very stable in Greenland uh, ice uh, became uh, one important building component so up on this hill here uh, the Vigsa house uh, it has the position now that we did a few years ago the budget was extremely low so we have to make everything like really effective uh, the first decision was to make a house, house made of uh, standard parts from the factory transported to the site on the water by one prom not two only one uh, and the second was, this, was that the client should carry every material from here up to here himself. So he did it from the drop-off area up to there during a summer. So it led us to this solution to make this, to use this standard laminated timber in manageable sizes and weights. So again, they built this main structure in a few days and then it became this uh, platform for the carpenter. So all components were dimensioned for uh, Peter, the client, to carry in, uh, carry this by himself. Just enough to make the structure stable. Even the windows were divided so you can carry one window uh, by, your, by yourself. So I show you a few, because again we look and study a lot of historical uh, projects, especially these prefabricated housing. Uh, this is a very cost-effective one in, in Sweden made, uh, I think it's in the 30s by Erik Friberger. It's called Typus A124. Very systematic. And uh, it's one of the first single family houses made uh, for prefabrication. So everything was really simplified. So even the roof was uh, completely flat, but the whole volume is actually tilted a little bit so the rain can uh, fall off. It was lifted on columns uh, for simple adaption to topography as well to be gentle to nature. This is a part of uh, Vedra, this island uh, I talked about before that we are uh, developing these uh, ideas about how to make uh, more affordable weekend houses in this area. And not only weekend houses but sometimes it gets permanent as well. Um, it's real expensive to build in Sweden. Uh, for the budget that we estimated here, you, got, you get like, let's say, 50 square meters or something normally for this budget, but we never work like that. We always divide everything into the components, what it costs and the time it takes to assemble. If it takes too much, then we try to make it more simple. So. Basically, as an opposite uh, to the life in the city, we want to provide for not a small 50 square meter, but a large spacious place to live in part, uh, as a part of the nature. So it's just a few points touching the ground. <clears throat> um, and we want to make not only the building part, but the nature as part of uh, the components as well, I would say. So it's sometimes casted directly on the rock, sometimes a little bit of concrete, uh, but not so much. So in Hovgården, uh, we're using parts from the local building catalog as well. Minimal waste, always the standard dimension uh, of, of everything that kind of creates this uh, structure. So it's this uh, thin as possible timber, uh, timber structure. Um, but to be able to uh, make it possible for future expansion. And then we have this lightweight recycled uh, fiberglass on the outside, protecting the structure from the wind and rain. So in the factory building I mentioned before, 
they we are actually already making uh, house housing types with this company, but it goes so well because it's extremely cost effective, and it uh, they sell it to um, let's say single family households with not so much money. Um, so. Uh, now the houses are built in a small factory in the southern part, so they want to build, uh, move the whole factory to the Stockholm area. So therefore, also if they want, want to expand it, so therefore we are do, working with this. So we are proposing to use uh, their old factory in the southern parts of Sweden to make the new one. And they are always using this uh, wooden stud, it's the standard 45 times 170 in the houses. And uh, the prices, as I mentioned, for a lot of timber and metal is like crazy now. It's like up to 300%. So we will build the whole factory uh, only using this component, like this in plan and this in elevation. It's very cheap and uh, easy to work with. So basically it's like a balloon frame structure, uh, taking care of both uh, horizontal and uh, uh, lateral forces. So all elements here as well, according to the transportation measurement, the wall, the pillar, uh, the truss. <clears throat> so it will start uh, construction in, I think, less than a year now. So it's in a planning phase. So um, a year ago, a little bit more, one and a half year ago, I got a call from a carpenter that actually built one of our first houses that has bought a piece of land in uh, uh, Nacka, it's called, outside Stockholm. Uh, he didn't have any wishes basically, but his only criteria was that he needed to build everything by himself. The walls to be built uh, horizontal, lying on the ground, and then a small crane to lift them in position. So we had uh, some initial sketches that we calculated, I think, to maybe 10 or 15 crane lifts. So we proposed to use only two lifts, two walls, basically. So the walls are seven meters tall, and in between there are some uh, hanging slabs. In the architecture museum, we started to combine the leftover pieces exactly as they are to make suitable display uh, furniture. So it's a kind of balance between function, size, weight, movability. I think we have around uh, 20, 25 objects at the moment, from really small ones to larger ones that uh, will be uh, covered with uh, professional fabrics of different functions, like uh, to be able to close it off completely in darkness, <laughs> to also create like semi-climate, <clears throat> in order to uh, uh, show really sensitive uh, uh, pieces like photographs and everything, uh, things like that. So basically, you can answer. <laughs> you take uh, some water. Okay, so basically, <clears throat> basically it's a place made of the existing a problem. So we always work together with uh, Akane Moriyama, she's uh, an architect, an ar artist and uh, does amazing work for fabrics. And together we always explore very fundamental things about you know light, transparency <coughs> and sometimes uh, also color. So this is the title of the second year we did in Mendrisio <clears throat> to maybe understand new ways of living. I think it's a need for changing behaviors in society, to use uh, less, to be aware. But it's very important to say that it's not simple as, uh, you know, poor. It's about um, um, simple, of dis simple decisions, let's say, with extended qualities in life, not the opposite. So the contour of the plan in Hogwarten has been established. After a lot of time on this place, observing all the light, cold, warm, uh, warm wind, animals, water, um, it's only one tiny volume that is uh, insulated, a bit like my uh, grandparents' small cabin inside this space. 
that can be heated quickly. Um, so it's a structure in the nature that can provide for several several uh, platforms inside, and also the nature is a part of the house. So this is another topic we are dealing with a lot. I mean, it's very sensitive for us because, uh, uh, I mean, especially in Nordic countries, during the winter, the sun goes down at around uh, two, three in the afternoon, uh, like like here. So in the winter, basically, we live in uh, darkness. Uh, when the spring comes, which is uh, actually quite soon, I mean, it's opposite way around. Everyone is uh, celebrating. It's like when Argentina wins World Cup. It's uh, they start to you know talk, interact. They move themselves uh, always to the light, not the shadow. Uh, I told uh, before earlier today that we have some foreign people from southern Europe and uh, I mean they are really struggling in the office. So our sp space is also like a lot about handling light and maybe filtering it in different ways um, to achieve as much uh, energy and much, as, much, as much light as possible. So from uh, Bruno Matson's summer house, this is a sequence uh, from the courtyard through the inside and the outside garden. So we made this uh, the whole roof in this uh, uh, semi-transparent uh, uh, material, uh, some wooden lures to cover it from the direct southern sun. Uh, otherwise, it's completely uh, natural light inside this space. Every bathroom has natural light from above. These are some pictures from Mikkel Olsson that we collaborate with a lot. He's an amazing photographer. Um, he made a book about this house as well. Uh, the terrace of the small house in uh, Vigsö is facing northwest, I think. Uh, so it's quite nice because it never gets too warm out there, but the light is very special underneath this roof. Uh, the product is uh, it's, it's a recipe from the 50s, made in Sweden actually. It's fiber armed, it's very strong and lasting, and it actually filters the light in a very just beautiful way. In the factory building, uh, there is a constant natural light filtering through the wooden structure. In larger housing projects, we often try to maximize uh, the outer spaces, the balconies, uh, as much as possible. Often with a layer of clear glass on the outside, one single layer, uh, to make it possible to use the balcony. I mean, otherwise in Sweden, if you have balcony, it's like five days a year that you can use it. It's really a waste of money, I would say. But this only adjustment to have this single glass, it may, makes it possible to use it five or six months of a year, uh, but still m maintaining the views and light, not to cover it. So this is the Hammarby Gård project um, <clears throat> that is in rather central spot in Stockholm, and the contour was fixed by the uh, detailed plan. We maximize the possibilities within the plan regarding volume, but also balconies. We did every par apartment facing two sides to get the sun from morning to evening. This is a project that was we built more than 10 years ago now, I think. So we added three different window types to the opening, <clears throat> to the street uh, side. This uh, window with horizontal uh, division like this, so it's like this kind of... Uh, extra balcony so you can open up uh, the lower part in safety glass um, and to the balcony these double doors and then we have the single glass on the outside in huge sliding doors so these horizontal windows facing the street makes the whole facade like uh, hundreds of recessed balconies in the summer which is really nice to see you don't really see it here but these are old pictures and the garden uh, uh, side with the glass facade is quite different, but still uh, the both uh, sides has different qualities, let's say, uh, but in, in a different way. So we we try, I mean, we, we try to be architects, we try to be designers, but we also are realistic. We notice a lot that programs are changing a lot, even in housing. So for instance, uh, we thought we did a, a proper analysis, uh, analysis of this uh, 
local market in uh, Brunstorp project where it turned to be almost uh, perfect. It, it, it was a little bit uh, difficult to sell everything. I think 90% were sold uh, directly in one week, but uh, these ones were really difficult because we made like a duplex apartment it, and nobody wanted it. Uh, so the building was built and we just uh, adapted it uh, on the inside because the structure was uh, letting us um, do that. We invented a new type and then it, I think, took another week and then it was sold. And this is a project, it's called Unity, it's now finished. Uh, it was the same there. Uh, I think we changed from 30 apartments to 80 apartments at one point within the structure. It was already built. As well in our work, we try to reuse, we try to wait as long as possible with the drawing and computer, collect everything, all the structural uh, uh, schemes, uh, uh, water uh, in different layers, use of material, what was good and what was not really working, and then we reuse, <coughs> refine and uh, adapt to new uh, projects. So we are yeah, really into like economic responsibility. I mean, in Sweden, we're not actually responsible for budgets, which is a bit special, but we try to be it because we think it's really a tool to become in charge of projects, to make better projects for the us user in the end. So we always try to figure out where to add extra values to the user to understand what is really important. So the challenge in Brunstorp project, for instance, uh, this long tilted vol volume uh, was about two main conditions. The first one was to propose something that could have the same qualities as uh, the villas, because it's an area of villas around. The second was about price. It's a very remote location with prices about, at that time, I think it was 25% of uh, Stockholm prices. So it's, um, uh, and together with that it's Sweden is uh, the most expensive country to build in, in Europe at the moment uh, it was almost an impossible equation so we needed to make something extremely cost effective but with same or even better qualities uh, than a villa or a single family house in the area so this image we did actually in the car to the first meeting that the city is there uh, we drove, drove uh, drive by, by the site and we, we made this. And this is during construction. We started to see the views at the different uh, <coughs> levels. And uh, except for uh, giving uh, all units maximized view, we established this kind of few components that we're really fighting for. I mean, in Sweden, this kind of sliding doors in uh, not only two, but three tracks is it's, uh, extremely luxurious and expensive. And in this house, housing project, this was almost impossible. But this was one thing that we really wanted. Also to have this uh, single glass on the outside of the balcony, because it's an amazing view, but it's quite windy. So this would make it more useful. Um, so actually in this case, uh, a little bit of the budget was left uh, when we finished the building. So in the end, we added this freestanding uh, sauna on top of the building. Um, the <laughs> concrete uh, delivery was of course uh, already de delivered, so we couldn't make it in concrete, but wood is very easy and simple to build. So, um, so it became like this and uh, it's connected to an outdoor terrace up here. and. Uh, the people living here use it a lot, um, and it's a sauna, so it's uh, it's nice. So we don't, uh, as I mentioned before, do a lot of models, but sometimes for structural ones, and it's uh, always a pleasant feeling. It's uh, for us, for clients, to see this kind of. Um, we never fill it with anything, we always keep it open uh, to see this kind of uh, endless possibilities of, uh, of something. To start to imagine themselves what it could become. So this is from a competition in Belgium we did a few years ago. 
it's a central winery uh, that was supposed to be inhabited in this small, it was a small train station. So the cost of renovating it, when we discovered it was extremely a lot, so we made this decision to make the ruin as a part uh, of the building without renovating it. <laughs> so instead of... Uh, um, um, framing it or only working with this one and adding something we framed the whole plot basically with this uh, shell uh, I think this was uh, five or six years ago we didn't win of, unfortunately but um, it became and it created three times larger volume so we imagined this not only to become a winery but a cultural institution for uh, other uh, possibilities also, again, like this uh, cultural, other cultural building we're working on, Boken, to give space for more like microeconomists uh, to be able to grow larger, different kind of additional programs, initiatives, uh, like a cultural working dev device. So, yeah, in as you might understand by now, in the studio we. In our office, we often try to avoid thinking about program from the beginning. It's very challenging, especially when you work with developers because they cannot demand it. But in changing time, I think we are we try never to force use or program. We challenge ourselves, but also clients to make open-ended structures in relation to a local context that could be provide for other possibilities. And uh, I, I remember Andreas Rube, a friend from uh, Berlin, he has written a lot of amazing stuff. He, uh, he mentioned or he described this uh, kind of tactics that we are doing is quite well like, like a surgeon. They are quite often practice with the left hand if they're right handed. Um, no operations, only practice. And in that way, they, you know, uh, get better with uh, both hands and you can think of things in a completely different way. So in this sense we're removing let's say one of the most fundamental aspects of architecture program but after a while program will uh, uh, slowly starting to develop naturally and this is something that I really admire and find uh, beautiful. So in UNITEA, this housing project, the load-bearing structure was very limited to be able to adapt. In Indonesia, this group that were working with the scaffolding technique I showed you before, <coughs> they made uh, it possible for the village uh, to stay and grow, even though it's always caused by flooding, by heavy natural forces. So they made this uh, uh, tower only, only with the scaffolding technique. Uh, like a, not a housing tower, but uh, platforms for living, basically. In Sweden, um, they dealt with this uh, challenge about and support for, it's a need now for people that are starting to move out from the cities a little bit. So they use this uh, light wooden beam, uh, wooden stud and bolts that you can basically carry yourself, your own house, avoiding trucks, cranes. In Kanshatka, a new type of open-ended structure for both humans and uh, non-humans, dealing with extreme natural conditions, multiple level of uh, uh, time span. In Galapagos, curing microsystems, emerging where the structure will host and be a part of the systems to be born and to die and reborn again as a part of an active process not only dealing with houses and structures, but also nature as a part of this. <coughs> so, um, both my grandparents, Bruno Matson, they were really inspired by this and a part of this kind of natur naturist movement. Uh, it was initiated by a guy called Ara Verland, and uh, he wrote this book, Old at 20, Young at 60, uh, which is amazing <laughs> stuff. And uh, he spent uh, six months outside, sleeping out here, obsessed by living outside. Uh, and like the modernists seek for the light and air, this uh, 
guys wanted oxygen and sun. It was very primitive. They built cabins in the up in the treetops. Bruno Matson he did uh, started like the shares, but also the small inventions like he slept outside also during the year. And in Sweden is of course very extreme, but he made this um, uh, very simple device that was slightly insulated um, to be able to use it in the sun. And he was also quite influenced by Raymond Benham in the 60s uh, formulated uh, the term um, architecture as a service, I think. Yeah. So basically it's about um, two things, avoidance, shelter from sun, wind, rain, but also interaction of local conditions to create this comfortable uh, environment, this kind of soft softness. An open fire, for instance, producing light and heat. And the unprogram unprogramming of the house is something really relating to this. Bruno Matson also did these small, amazing advices, like, I mean, by this time in the 50s, the women uh, usually were cooking and they were inside the kitchen that was like in the back of the house, completely cut off from social life. Uh, so he was not very happy about this, so he created these uh, movable small kitchens, like the stove. And uh, so it made it possible to cook, but also to show, socialize and meet at the same time. And yesterday I was sitting here in this beautiful space by uh, Marcelo and uh, Sebastian, uh, preparing this uh, talk a little bit. Um, um, it was re it's special there because you don't really know if you're in the city or in the countryside or, or something and I think it's really working. In the Vedi house um, I think uh, another aspect is, is uh, the sound f for me a lot. You hear it's, it rains a lot in Sweden but the sound of the rain I think it's uh, the sound of a house is quite amazing to, to in have this uh, kind of ingredients. Gridar and you also see it going down for from this uh, huge roof and this uh, <clears throat> park project that is under construction right now we made all the apartments like uh, basically like villas like this uh, super tall uh, opening with a railing and uh, openable doors so this I think is from the 14th story and this is the church by the way that we're we cannot go <laughs> higher than I was there during construction uh, a couple of weeks ago and the feeling was uh, very, very present. The house at Rågholmen, <clears throat> we made us a floor and a roof basically uh, on the rock to integrate with uh, uh, the ground. Uh, we worked with uh, uh, this kind of uh, the light and the air conditions to get it into the house. A floor basically as outside with this uh, uh, excavated uh, fireplace in the center. Between this, we placed this huge. Uh, we spent a lot of the budget on these huge uh, sliding windows that you can open up basically uh, two thirds of the whole uh, facade. Inside, we worked with the curtain maker Akane. She did this amazing, I think it's 50 meter curtain in different uh, tones that is like an art piece in itself. Constantly shifting in transparency and, and light. When we took pictures of the, this house, we actually tested, um, tested the house at the same time. So we started from closed windows, closed curtains, we started to open the windows, letting the wind pass a little bit, getting a breeze inside. And it was quite a special moment because we really you know, felt the uh, uh, nature, the natural conditions, the wind, the sun, the, the natural light in the, in the house. In Vilam Sun, where this carpenter is building for himself, the house with the two walls, <clears throat> the nature is uh, almost inside the house. In Boken, in uh, the cultural building in Vietlanda, <coughs> the top part will be uh, a restaurant and they will plant their own uh, uh, food there, veg vegetables and stuff like that. Midwick House as a piece of infrastructure uh, within the garden. And this is from today. I was very happy to start to see the first outside layer. 
uh, the windows were mounted and uh, it's a it was quite amazing experience and we are also discovered new spaces like from closed and this is completely closed and then you start to open the windows you have this room <coughs> protected from the wind but open to the sky similar as uh, Bruno Matson house so it was it's a very simple house but it has this uh, richness of uh, spaces that was really special to experience today I think um, then we need to work a little bit on some de details but that's uh, how it is so this kind of duality is for me uh, very important. It's a Swedish word, it's lagom, it's like uh, in between. I think it's the only la language that has this uh, really clear thing that lagom is actually, it's a good word. You should never uh, try something extra. But we, I mean, in our case, we, we really try to push our work in either uh, in, in some direction, to the right or to the left, but always in a direction and never try to f get in between. It's very, it's not very easy. And uh, with pressure from builders, uh, developers, it's uh, sometimes uh, really difficult to handle, but I think we try at least, and we, we are constantly finding tools of making this happen. And I think this is important for you as some students maybe also to think like that, that I mean, nothing is impossible. It's uh, really about uh, understanding, getting the tools, and then you can be completely free. So, um, one point uh, last semester, we started by discovering this kind of, this was a combination of very radical project, but always built projects, <clears throat> which is again, the core of what we're doing. Like this inflatable church uh, by Hans Müller, it was made for a priest. Um, that could bring the church on his bike in France. And this is, uh, I don't know what it, how much it weighed, but it was not so much. So it became this covered space for around 200 people. Uh, and uh, yeah. yeah, the weight was, I think, five kilos or something. And this is from a wedding, for instance. So the students at the pro try to understand this spectacular stru uh, structure but it's very simple actually, it's just a cube with a, some an angular adjustments uh, that made it possible for the structure to stand. He also actually poured, or you need to pour a little bit of water on top to make it stable. And then it's um, uh, making vertical pressure to the structure and then it's completely fine. Uh, we discovered a lot of projects, uh, which is it was quite amazing, like this transmission tower in Russia by Shukov. Uh, the purpose was to be, of course, taller than the Eiffel Tower, um, but using 70% less material. So it was prefabricated beams of metal, like this matrio matrioska structure system with uh, five independent drums to erect it. So it's a super impressive project, and there are a few towers left still. So a lot of people have passed this house and really don't know what it is, if it's a, I don't know, a house or a school or something. We we're talking today also that uh, we got the same similar feeling and the similar question, if it's a shed in a garden, if it's a warehouse, if it's a house. Uh, and this is the kind of, I don't know, the ambition in every project to be a little bit off um, in what you're doing actually. A platform, a translucent roof, one meter above the meadow uh, to let the people and their own way of living to create their building and inside it's uh, in our opinion, in opinion the most uh, sustainable approach to present this kind of framework this is the Unitea project when it was finished and I think it survived uh, four or five uh, different uh, inside uh, options from again 30 to 80 and I think it's finished in 50 apartments or something like that. Um, in the 50s this uh, project also by this uh, Erik Friberg who did this uh, prefab uh, small house that I showed you before. He made this amazing uh, project in the west coast of Sweden like uh, three platforms quite radical but built and uh, very just inspiring for, for us. 
and it was uh, in concrete, like a garage, basically. And uh, each floor had uh, were divided into plots. I think f- from around 200 square meters, 18 plots for the people to develop themselves. So, in this cultural building, we're using similar principles. We propose to add these four floors that can become eight. That. Uh, uh, is provided for mixed use culture not for only the village but for the surrounding the larger context everything is made in wood the 12,000 square meter factory building made in the most simple wooden stud additional screws that will provide for a large space to make new low cost uh, houses this is the next uh, bed house (coughs) that will be among birch trees not by the leaves, but just uh, in the middle of the uh, tree trunks, basically. And uh, in um, our own project, we <laughs> might discover this uh, structure in the coming years, which will try to be quite independent. We will grow food, uh, use the sun and stove. My uncle will help me to make a special one to be able to cook and to heat this space a lot. Um, it has been a really difficult project because it uh, has been constantly shifting because of the global changes in economy we are experiencing. But at the same time, it has been uh, like a driving force to become what it is now. Um, and these central questions I posted has been maybe more central than ever. How to build a little bit more simple and live a little bit more simple. And this is uh, something that I appreciate and I hope you uh, can maybe start to think a little bit about these topics as well in connection to your work in either in academia or professional. But I think it's uh, it's an interesting way, you don't have to believe in it or not, but it's something that I think needs to be at least considered in in new ways. So um, I think this was the last image. Thank you so much for listening, even though my bad speaker. for your wonderful presentation. It was really a pleasure to listen to you. I was really um, amazed by the coherence. And I, I really like the coherence of the, of the presentation and the exchangeability of a lot of the ideas, how uh, this structure to cover a large volume mm. then became a table in the museum. So mm. I, I think that was very inspiring. Uh, we have some time for questions, if you're not tired from your day, you know who wants to start. I have a, a, a small one. Uh, being a photographer, I was uh, really surprised by the appearance of, of these new renderings in, in your work that appear with this publication for the copies and in the recent years and that weren't before. I, I don't know if you have some, some thoughts about that. Um, no, <clears throat> I think we, we are quite um, uh, black and white in what we are doing all the time. So it's uh, again no gray <laughs> in our work. We work a lot in hand, by hand. Not so many drawings, we don't try so much, one or two. And then um, I personally, I, 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 I want to know what we will be doing if we are making an image and not to cheat, not to take away f- things, not to uh, mess things up and not to make uh, an image of something that is not realistic. So it's, um, it's a language that we are starting to uh, maybe, I don't know, 
developing and that is interesting for us that it's basically I mean, when we take pictures of the house and we photos with Mikael uh, it's uh, similar we we always do it uh, before people move in and in a way I, I I mean you should see these houses when they are inhabited it's quite amazing because it's full of life and everything but I find it very uh, just um, relaxing to see a space and honest to see a space as it is and not putting a language to it, not putting a, you know, a, a specific thought of or try to frame the viewer of something, but just honest and, and quite naked. And, uh, and, uh, and then it can be, keep, become instead this kind of um, possibility of starting to imagine things that could happen within this space in different ways for every viewer, you and uh, everyone here. In different ways, not to frame it. So I think it has a similarity with uh, this kind of uh, representation. Thank you. That's a, that's a great answer. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Jochen, for, for the lecture. Uh, I uh, took a few notes, but I want to share maybe two with you. In order, to, there are no questions. Just uh, to. to keep the conversation going. Mm. Uh, in, in, a, in the moment of the lecture, uh, you describe yourself as uh, not as a designer, mm. uh, but uh, people who create filters mm. to, to see the, the things uh, in another way, mm. uh, to simplify mm. uh, the, your task maybe, mm. or, or the life. And then maybe you are, you say at the end of the sentence, you say, and maybe to add something, mm -hmm. like a, that, that maybe is something that needs to be added. Uh, there is a, I took another note that was uh, related to the Stockholm, uh, a Stockholm architectural museum. Um, and you described that, that the project, I mean, an architectural museum for an architect is a very big deal and mm. related like that. But I was quite impressed about the strategy that you took on that project. Mm. Uh, you, you say very in a very polite way, I guess, that you took the leftover of, uh, of a previous uh, show mm. uh, and, and, and then out of that, uh, I think I can say it. Uh, I, maybe I'm wrong, but that is a Tamil Videla uh, mm. uh, exhibition. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, I don't know if they know it yet, but. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so we have this uh, record is going to take uh, very long. So yeah. Maybe uh, but uh, but you, you, you mentioned that, that you took all, all that installation, which is very huge and very with a very big effort yeah. and you took like the, that piece of glass which are a lot and uh, the structure which is very strong mm. in order to, to create the, the renovation not for your exhibition but to the whole uh, architecture museum yeah so I don't know I want to know a little bit more if mm. it's possible uh, yeah that's it yeah no it's uh it's a, it was a nice, uh, I liked this process with them because they were, I think, interviewing uh, uh, 40, 50 offices internationally and everything, but they didn't have a brief, so it was only like talking conversations and everything. And then we got the commission, uh, but still they didn't have a brief. And then we have uh, more discussions about what this space could become. And uh, <clears throat> and then suddenly the brief was kind of creating itself about what we believed in that could happen there. So then we have a, had a starting point um, uh, that we were all agreed on. So that was, a, like I think, a really good start. But then we made this uh, proposal that actually was, uh, it's uh, like a, almost a book now we have so much material and sketches and drawings and notes and everything because we were there a lot like i said we had this card and found this amazing stuff um they thought we were like staying there for the night but it was um 
but we, yeah, then we basically, I mean, it's it's about they they wanted us to design a, a new museum for all the collection, uh, the temporary and uh, the existing one, which is uh, huge, of course. So they need a huge amount of uh, furniture, displays, uh, closed rooms, and everything. They wanted to basically close the whole museum, all the windows. It's uh, old military hangars, amazing with a lot of natural light and everything. So th this was um, something that they wanted to close everything, but we we started just to think about all these small details that we didn't want a close museum. We want a museum of air, of uh, natural light. So we started to dismantle in our minds and drawings <clears throat> all the pieces and then created objects that were taking care of all this uh, the light uh, the climate uh, displaying of uh, all the pieces in different ways uh, and it was quite funny because it was actually it you know if you should design a new architecture museum then it's uh, it's not an easy thing as you mentioned it's uh, how should you do that i mean the, the, the treasure is the archive, and, you know. So it was quite convenient and, and, and fun because we didn't design everything. It was just we started to connect and, uh, and we had uh, 150, 200 objects <clears throat> that were we narr narrowed down all the time and then it became 50 more and then we narrowed it down. And, and all the time we had uh, close control of the, all the pieces, of course, that, is existing and how it kind of shrank and, and grew according to what we produced. So it was a quite tough uh, challenge to make this uh, project, uh, but uh, but very uh, I don't know enjoyable or something. It was uh, different. So in in the summer now they will start to dim dismantle everything and this exhibition. And uh, I, I don't think these architects know about this, but that we will transform everything into new objects. But I think it will be published uh, soon. with a statement saying new realism. I understand that in some way it's a way of looking at things as they are. And I'm uh, saying it is what it is. The climate is what it is. The economy is what it is. Construction is what it is. Uh, but also at some point things look at that as what we might think is what it is, and think what it can also be. Mm. Um, I wonder if in your process, mm. does it also arise the question and the debate of what comfort is? Mm. Mm, yeah, <laughs> it's. Uh, I think it's. Um, it's not that we uh, uh, like um, accept the, what is happening. It's the opposite, I think. It's about understanding what is happening. And comfort is, of course, a um, central thing, I would say, in, in all this uh, research. So it's very, I mean, it's a very diverse and very, um, complex and rich method of understanding the very simple things like pillars and beams, but also the more un un understandable aspects like comfort, for instance. But, I mean, we're researching this uh, in a similar way, looking at uh, history, uh, addressing what we believe in, what, where we find things uh, comfortable, but also question the... Uh, today's behaviors of what is comfort because now I think 
I'm only speaking for what I know about in in my parts of uh, I mean the Nordic countries and everything. But it's it's much it's too much. It's you uh, you don't need so much in order to get this kind of comfort. You can get it much more comfortable with less uh, you know um, investment or something like that. So I think it's uh, I don't know if it's a, an answer, but it, I think it's or for us it's. We investigate it in a similar way as all the more technical aspects, uh, and uh, it's. Uh, I think it's also like it's important to say that it's. This is not uh, mathematics. It's. Uh, it's a combination of everything. It's. Uh, I mean, we do this calculation. We are super interested, but it's. It's a lot. Uh, it's a sensitive approach. I would say. Uh, it's a very like personal, and uh, we always take decisions. Of course, it's not like this is happening for of itself. But speaking about comfort, for instance, then we turn it, this aspect upside down and uh, go into it as much as we can, but in a very personal way, I would say. But it's it's a it's an interesting question, and it's not super easy to to do this again with like developers and the common people because they're really used to something and then if you propose something that is uh, not completely different but a little bit different then it's you need to uh, uh, find ways of uh, uh, explaining or you know seeing but for us every product that we do uh, leads us a little bit more space to maybe raise the level a little bit the other one and so on so I think it's important not to rush. It's really like small steps. We do want. We don't. We cannot turn everything upside down. Like the housing market is uh, one thing. It took to control it is to maybe be a part of it, be a part of the investment. But it's not very easy in uh, Sweden and, and in, in Europe. I would say because the land is crazy expensive and the building cost is crazy expensive so it's a huge risk so then you need to find other tools to be in charge and control about this and it, it's uh, we're in the, in the middle of this process Hi again, um, sorry for the whole phone debacle. That's fine. <laughs> um, I was wondering how you deal with heating in the winters. Like you spoke about how um, you use um, layerings, like it wasn't like a wall. <laughs> um, and that, like, how maybe like in the summers, how do you deal with like cooling systems and mm. winter? How do you with mm. I don't know, maybe like even looking at that picture is just like um, how, yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's the question. Oh, it working? Yeah, it's uh, also a good question. No, but it's uh, in this case, it's about different layers, like a lot like like Thomas Sal are working uh, with different zones and buffer zones. Uh, and you have, for instance, one heating uh, component that heats up this, and then you can make the insulated volume much more simple. You can avoid a lot of layers by having it protected like that. So it's a quite economic system, and uh, in the end, you cannot, you don't have to use hardly any electricity because this smaller volume is heated and so on. So this is one approach, of course, but. It's quite. It's not so easy to translate it into housing because energy calculations in France, for instance, where they are operating, it's they can actually count this buffer zone within the calculation, but we it's not it's not possible because it's uh, uh, regulated that we cannot count buffer zones. So then we need to work in other ways of handling this. But I think every product is. Is quite unique because it's also like different if we're operating in northern Sweden or southern or in Europe every the climate is very different so we 
try to understand everything about it and then different methods of doing it. But we are working also with another project that is basically just a little bit thicker walls, for instance. And the idea is to not use uh, any additional heating, only the sun is heating this wall. And uh, it's, it's like very traditional passive systems techniques that, I mean, we, we've done, we have uh, thousands of pages of research about this, uh, but very, not this, uh, we don't want to include uh, systems, uh, like uh, technical systems, we try to avoid it, but make it natural all the time. Uh, but it's uh, you can when you go into this world of uh, knowledge and uh, different experiments, it's amazing, and you can learn a lot from it. So, so it's very diff It's not an easy answer. <laughs> but. Johan, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the precast building uh, with the church, the one that has mm. the setbacks. I thought that building was. Fascinating. It really like the dream of an architect. Uh, this idea of, that it's completely precasted pre and it's very neutral and, and and precise without being this Swiss architecture of perfect concrete and, and perfect analyze at the minimum mm -hmm. whatsoever. But I was also impressed by the scale of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wanted to know a little bit more about uh, the process of that building with the developer because it has a certain aesthetic. It's mm. not just a house in the landscape, it's now a tower mm. only defined by the structure, <laughs> only defined by glass and the joints. Mm. And, and I was wondering, uh, yeah, how was the impact of that? How, how was it seen? How the developer said, Okay, yeah. let's paint it. And, and yeah, no, it's, uh, as I mentioned, I mean, this uh, developer, uh, they're really, I think, good, uh, but they are very unexperienced. So we have this it's the same as this Brunstock project, the tilted one. That was the first one, and they, they didn't know anything. And uh, so we basically told them that this is uh, hardly possible because the economic situation and then it became possible and they actually made uh, a good uh, business out of it in the end. Um, and then they bought this piece of land and it's in the central part of the town. And they were like uh, almost as uh, naive as the first product, like, yeah, I mean, can you do a infill here, six stories, everything in six stories? Or like... Um, Okay, and they were, can you do it in two weeks or I mean, something like that? And then we, uh, we, uh, as I showed you, we, we made uh, this 40, 50 models. We started with a six story and, uh, and then it became an uh, ocean of options. And brought it to the table with them and the city architect for the first meeting, like an introduction. And uh, and then all of a sudden the city architect was like oh, going like this, and uh, we had knives and cutters and everything. So then we started to cut a little bit and uh, remodel it and uh, uh, adjust it uh, together. And that was the, like the beginning. Then it be didn't became like that, but that was the beginning of something that uh, we got everyone on board of this idea of actually not trying to push it a little bit and not make it an average uh, volume because I mean for us it was uh, the idea of making it taller was that it's very close to the university uh, and this uh, six-story option would be very exclusive and not so many apartments so we proposed to make this extra to make kind of the first part only smaller apartment, like student housing and stuff like that. And then a mix of uh, uh, raw houses and a little bit more exclusive. And uh, so it's a combination of different uh, <coughs> types, basically. So, I mean, it was a statement because of that to provide more housing for this part that really needs it. 
but also uh, a, a very good collaboration with uh, the city and the city architect. So it kind of it was uh, it was not again it didn't we didn't make the design there, but we opened a, a door to for us to be completely free of making what we really do. So so now it's uh, yeah it's almost up and um, it, it feels very calm in the city, even though it's quite tall for the city. Great, thank you. There's another question over there. Are you okay for no yes. questions? Yes. Um, thinking about how permanent your projects are, um, I want to know how do you solve the interaction, the relation between public and private spaces, not only thinking in a landscape context, but also in a urban context. Thank you. Mm, do, you do you refer to any specific projects or...? No, in general, uh, thinking of that image that you can see the other side of the, uh, the landscape and how about you, you solve this relation between the interior and the exterior? It's so interesting. Mm. Mm. <laughs> it's, um, again, it's very, I think I would say very different approach in every, like, as I mentioned uh, in housing projects quite often if it's not uh, very close to another building we want to give everyone as much view as possible um, so all this layering is as transparent as possible uh, in this case for instance it's first this this material that we use a lot and it's extremely <laughs> strong extremely cheap and uh, it's uh, recyclable also it's um, <coughs> it, I don't know, it gives you a certain level of uh, intimacy and it's almost like a curtain or something. Um, still it gives uh, full uh, natural light. So it's always this kind of balance, I guess, between uh, interaction of uh, landscape inside and, and outside. But again, it's, um, I think this is about the opposite of the systematic approach. It's, uh, it's uh, something that we work a lot with in our projects and then all of a sudden it just becomes what it is basically it's a natural uh, response not very sure if this was a spot-on answer but any other questions Think that you have like a work ethic or a, let's call it a philosophy in this mm. field. But what if you have a, a, a commission in I don't know, Dubai or places where, where where the concerns are others? And, and, and my question goes to, to, to the fact that uh, probably in the last 20 years architecture has shifted to doing less mm. uh, and not uh, like uh, going more, more deeply into other. other other sort of questions. Um, my, my question is if, if the context opens up new questions or, or if the studio is focused on a more general uh, mm. problem. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very good question and I think and uh, I hope that it will be so. And we are working a, a bit uh, international, internationally as well, mostly in Europe. And every project like that is a new landscape of uh, 
constraints or possibilities. So I think if the question is about uh, method or language, I think it's, it's, it's more of a method that we are doing. It's not uh, a language and I think it's uh, really, we try to avoid that as much as possible and that's also why I always want to push everyone in our studio and in the studio, academic studio, uh, as much as possible in uh, you know loose ground because then then you cannot uh, any longer do a predetermined uh, response to something or if you are very interesting in uh, certain construction technique or material you, it's it's just forget about all that and uh, look at the new uh, uh, possibilities and we we have a commission going on now in Asia for instance you mentioned Dubai and this is similar um, so we, I'm, I don't know what this will be but I'm very curious so I think it's a good question and maybe I can come back uh, with this uh, answer in a year or two Bueno, Johan thank you so much for your lecture and for your time <laughs> y muchas gracias a todos por venir recuerden que si no van a poner el comienzo tienen posters a los costados y nos vemos el próximo jueves y el próximo viernes para darnos actividad gracias